the next session is going to be a very special one. Uh, we have among us Mr. Umang Hathi Singh, cultural revivalist and designer. He is the fifth generation managing director and president of Hathi Singh Design Company, which is the oldest design company in Asia established in the year 1835. The Some of the crowning achievements of the company include Queen Victor the interiors of Queen Victoria's home, a show at the Buckingham Palace, and interiors of the White House. Hailing from the city of Ahmedabad, he graduated in business science from the Babson College USA, where he was awarded for leadership and humanities. He also went on to acquire a diploma in banking from Japan. He's on the governing body of the Ahmedabad Education Society. From 2011 to the present, Mr. Hathi Singh has been invited to various prestigious educational institutes and museums as an expert to share his insights on traditions and culture of Gujarat. <clears throat> its future within handicrafts, along with the aspects of sustainability and the business behind it. Some of these prestigious organizations include the Piramil Museum of Art, Baruch District Management Association, Oman India Joint Business Council, and World Craft Council. His achievements are too many for me to introduce right now. I would hand it over to Professor, uh, beg your pardon, Mr. Hathi Singh himself. I think it's not wrong to call him a professor given his experience uh, to Mr. Hathi Singh himself. His topic for today's session is a tale of three cities. Over to you, sir. How, how do I join? What do... Uh, sir, just share your screen, sir. You can start yeah. speaking. You're already live. Perfect. Good afternoon, everybody. You know, I am very happy to address the students joining uh, UID and Kanawatu University, the young sort of torch bearers of design that will take India into the future. You know, all of you, are, you know, many of you are from Ahmedabad and many of you will be coming to Ahmedabad. And you know, I would like to share with you why is Ahmedabad important and what is its legacy of design? So I'm going to take you on a little journey. Shakespeare had written a very wonderful play called Tale of Two Cities, where we have modified it to make it a tale of three cities, you know? And I'm going to start with that, Tale of Three Cities. All these three cities are UNESCO World Heritage Cities. And they were cities not built by great kings or emperors, but by its people, its merchant princes, who brought great amounts of economic prosperity and were therefore patrons of the art and design. You might know the first two cities very well, but I'm going to introduce the third as well. Florence, Venice, and Ahmedabad. These are the three cities that we are going to narrate and talk about. The Medici's of Florence, you know, the merchants of Venice and the Mahajans of Ahmedabad. The Medici's, you know, were the most important and influential family in Europe throughout the, you know, the, through the centuries and contributed to art and design in various formats. The history of Florence can produce one of the most exceptional gems, which till today, the Domo, the Uffizi Gallery, which is a collection of the Medici's, and the statue of David, which everybody in the world knows is one of the finest countries in the world, but all the legacies of the Medici family. And it is indeed extremely beautiful to visit Florence. They also have a great design school. Look at the doors made by Bertuccelli and the frescoes of Madonna and Child. These are the lasting legacies that the world over goes to Florence to see. It's a statue of David and that's the Uffizi Gallery. You know, they are exceptional. And they are all marked. And this legacy from early times of Florence still continues. And you have the Petit Umo, which is the world's most important uh, sort of fair for menswear. From David to Petit Umo, the legacy continues as one of the world's most important platforms for men's clothing, accessories, and launching of new projects in men's fashion in the 21st century. Venice. Venice is again one of the most beautiful cities in the world. The Silk Road, which started in China and went to the entire world in Asia and Europe, ended in Venice. 
And Venice became one of the most beautiful centers for creating exquisite products. The, the hand-blown glass of Venice, velvet was created in Venice, the silk came from China, and the Venetians divided, sort of designed it into the most beautiful fabrics, which sort of dawned and created the, the uh, grand kings of Europe and the Ottomans. So you had a St. Mark's Basilica, you had a Dodge Palace. Again, you know, exceptional, and there are no great palaces of Venice or of Florence. The beautiful villas or havelis and palazzos. They all belong to the mercantile, mercantile community which brought wealth and prosperity to these three cities. So th that is why these three cities are very extremely important to humanity and our world heritage cities. Venice continues its legacy of design and art and patronage with the continuation of the Venice Biennale and the Venice Film Festival. Both these events you know, in today's generation and today's century are extremely important and gives people around the world involved in art, design and creativity a platform to showcase the best that is happening in the world. And then comes Ahmedabad. And everybody asks me, why is Ahmedabad important? Well, let me take you on why a journey which will explain and showcase why Ahmedabad is important. And it became the first city in India to be a UNESCO declared World Heritage City before Varanasi, Jaipur, or Delhi. So, you no, know, what we say about ourselves is advertising. What others say about us is editorial. So let's take Europe, the French traveler, travel, Cavalier, who lived in the time of Louis XIV and Shah Jahan, that has written about Ahmedabad as the most beautiful city in the world. He traveled to Ahmedabad several times and bought the most exquisite jewels for his patrons, royal families in Europe. Ahmedabad has a very nice beginning. The, the king, Ahmed Shah Badshah, had come to, you know, was hunting one day and on the banks of the river Sabarmati. And his hounds were attacked by the hares, a rabbit attacking a dog. That was very, very strange. And the king realized that if the hares of or the rabbits of this river and this region are so strong, proud, and confident that they could even attack the hounds, what would the people be like? And that created the city of Ahmedabad, and the legend has it. So prosperous was this city, and the merchants of Ahmedabad and the Mahajans of Ahmedabad, the mercantile princes, that throughout the medieval, medieval times, during, during the Mughal rule and beyond, it was the largest and the most prosperous city of India. So much so that the legend has it that it was the home of Sri Lakshmi. And the wealth of Sri Lakshmi was in the walled city of Ahmedabad. The earliest reference to this city occurs as Ashawal. Ashawal in Al in India, where he mentioned the travelers of that time, and this is 11 foot, uh, describe it as a town populous, commercial, rich, industrious, and productive of useful articles. What are useful articles and production industrial? It has to be designed before it can be made and sold. Therefore, it became a center for design and trade. And it flourished so well, it became the center of trade and commerce in all of India. The Badra Fort, you know, the World, World Heritage Monument, and you have the Hati Singh Temple, and the Kirti Stam, which are also ex exquisite example of Solanki architecture, which flourished in Gujarat. The Dalat Stepwell and the Jarukhas are all pristine examples of very well-designed architectural monuments. And Ahmedabad has the most number of architectural ASI declared A-grade monuments than any other city of India, more than even Agra or Varanasi. If you see the architectural design and, and proportions, they match even the Taj Mahal. And they, they were made before that. It was the principal city of the Sultans of Gujarat till it was annexed by the Mughal Emperor Akbar in 1573 AD and came directly under Mughal rule. I mean, 
it was very interesting because people say that Akbar was no. Uh, if people, most of you must have seen Jodha Akbar, but more, but it starts from when Akbar was already a young prince, not when Akbar was born. And when Akbar was born in Umarkot, and he, you know, to Humayun, and he lived there till his young age before he came, returned to India as king. Humayun returned. He had tremendous Hindu influences because Raja Umarkot was Hindu, and coming there, he, the uh, people of Ahmedabad, which were ruled by different sultans invited Akbar to annex Ahmedabad and Ahmedabad became directly under Mughal rule. But it was not Delhi that ruled Ahmedabad, it was Ahmedabad that ruled Delhi. Because Akbar was, in, during Akbar's rule as a young, people say he was advised from behind the curtain and his administration because he was a young boy. And one of the people who advised him was the, the Mahajans of Ahmedabad. And, his, so, and from that time to, till today, with the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Ahmedabad has had a direct influence on Delhi. And the new parliament in Ahmedabad, in Delhi, which is being built, is designed again by Bimal Patel from Ahmedabad. Though it was being ruled from afar, it retained its position as a premier center of trade and commerce. And during the Mughal time, the first mint was established here and the economic growth was here. Akbar specifically took interest in the weaves and textiles of Gujarat, which led him to having his personal Poshak Khana situated in Ahmedabad. Think about it. From Asha Valley, created Asha Valley weaves in Brokage, which is the center before Banaras, the weaving center. Akbar, in his Aine Akbar, he has very well documented that his Poshak Khana and his grand costumes were created in Ahmedabad. So fashion from even Akbar's time was from Ahmedabad. Akbar and Jangir have also taken keen interest in the textile techniques, the workmanship, and the metaphorical potential of this cloth. So gold brocades and, the, and fine cottons came from Gujarat. And these are very well documented Aine Akbari, Patsha Nama, and Jangir Nama. You know, this became also the center of producing coins and coinage. So metallurgy and designing metal things were also very important in Ahmedabad and today Gujarat is also the center for producing for automotive parts and you had automobile industry. The origins of casting go back to that time and that is an exceptional period of design because these things need to be designed to perfection for in engineering to grow and flourish successfully. You know, so this is again in Aine Akbari and, you know, it is recorded that Ahmedabad produced very fine and different kinds of cloths between 19, 1591 and 1592. 30 different types of cotton fabrics and their respective prices. I mean, imagine 30 types. And it is no exception that, you know, Mahatma Gandhi created the Khadi movement in the Charkha in Ahmedabad. From Akbar's time to Mahatma Gandhi, the, the creation of the Charkha or the loom, hand loom, was very inspiring from Ahmedabad. And both, all these were designed to perfection. With the Mughal rule, there came an influence of Mughal design and aesthetics. See, earlier part of India you know, had very traditional Solanki style of architecture and design. But with the influence of the Gujarat Sultan, especially under the Mughal rule, Ahmedabad absorbed Islamic elements and Mughal designs flourished in Ahmedabad. In 1593, you know, what have world travelers written about Ahmedabad? Because that is what we need to reflect. Is Ahmedabad is unique in the whole of India in matters of neatness and flourishing conditions. And it is superior to other cities in its excellence of its monuments. It would be no exaggeration to say that in the whole world, there exists no town so grand and beautiful. This is recorded in in, 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 19, in, sorry, in 1593. Shah Jahan, you know, India's great king and emperor who made the most beautiful design that is known for you know, Shalima Gardens, the Taj Mahal, the Red Fort, you know, and Shah, of Shah Jahan of Old Delhi. The Shah Jahan, who stood as the next emperor, brought in with him a lot of exquisite monuments to Ahmedabad, which included the Moti Mahal Pad. Shah Jahan, as young Prince Khuram, came to Ahmedabad 
and built his first building. The first building Shah Jah ever built was the Moti Mahal Palace in Ahmedabad, which is now known as the Sardar Patel National Memorial. But it was built by Shah Jah as his first building. The beginning was here. His last building was the Taj Mahal in Agra. Emperor Shah Jahan considered the crafts of Gujarat exemplary and his poet, poet laureate, Kasan, records, there is an art inspiring breeze. Call it not Gujarat, but India's Greece. So, you know, that was a position Ahmedabad and Gujarat held in the world of design because Greece created fantastic sculptures, you know, and so did Ahmedabad. James Douglas wrote, Shah Jahan, James is a very important British historian, and he has written, Shah Jahan, it is not nothing for nothing thou art in Ahmedabad. Thy God is architecture, and thy light, the seven lamps, lamps thereof. The bud was here, the blossom and fruit to be in Agra. Everything has a beginning. Greece before Rome, Damascus before Cairo, Agra follows Ahmedabad. So, you know, the most beautiful building in the world, designed by Shah Jahan, has its origins in Ahmedabad. A German travel mandalist in 1638 described it as the headquarters of manufacturers, the greatest city in India, nothing inferior to Venice, an unsurpassed commercial emporium where merchants from any part of Asia could be had and where foreign bills could be exchanged. Think about it, even in 1638, Ahmedabad was an international commercial emporium which showed the finest goods from around the world and you could trade in any currency. That required a very important system designed for operations. Systems need to be designed too. Sir Thomas Rowe thus writes to King James of England during Changi's reign, Ahmedabad is a godly city as large as London. Now, you know, it was Thomas, in the time of Jahangir, that the East India Company, the first ship, the Hector of the British Empire, landed in the port of Surat, and the trade in cotton and indigo started. And to have the right to trade in India, so Thomas Rowe had to sign a treaty for the East India Company to operate, and that was done in Ahmedabad with, with Emperor Jahangir. And 200 years later, of course, the Union Jack started flying over India, but for those 200 years, to the trade in spices, cotton, and indigo that brought wealth to India and trade with Europe. And these products, in fact, have now become very important because denim, denim jeans are made of cotton and indigo, the origins of which lie in Andaman. The Mughal emperors who followed Aurangzeb. You know, Aurangzeb was the last great Mughal emperor, you know, were weak and themselves could not hold the kingdom together because Aurangzeb had signed off the treaty to the East India Company to collect tax. And the British collected tax from Calcutta and created Calcutta as their capital in India, in the West. And this became the area where the Mughals and the Marathas and the British ruled together to men, so nobody wanted to kill the hen that laid golden eggs. It was important to all three. James Forbes, in his Oriental Memoirs, published in 18... See, after the Mughal Empire collapsed you know, with the British, the last thing Bahadur Shah Zafar was exiled to Burma and the Mughal emperors were killed. And, you know, it is now the East India Company ruling India. And with the coming of the East India Company, what happened was came a great influence of European design. And he came from the Oriental Memoirs, Rice of Ahmedabad. Until this visit to Ahmedabad, I had no conception to the extent of the Oriental magnificence, the palaces and buildings, the, had, and the splendid chambers described in the Arabian Nights entertainment appear no longer overcharged or fabulous. Can you imagine what the interior and design would have been like? It, it impressed everybody that the Arabian Nights stories could well have been written with Ahmedabad homes as a center of design. It was in 1818 when the British East India Company took over the city as part of the conquest of India. 
and that the city earth into an era of orderly development progress. This is again recorded by British, not that it was not unorderly, but British brought in their own systems and own things. And Ahmedabad became an important city of trade for the British and the East India Company. During that declaration, you know, with Queen Victoria, see the East India Company became so prosperous that Queen Victoria, the Queen of England, said, I need to have a piece of this pie and make sure that, that the East India Company was brought under the crown. You know, and Queen Victoria declared herself as the Empress of India. And with the declaration, Queen Victoria being the Empress of India, making the grandest event of the 19th century. That was King George and uh, Queen Mary in the, in the later on. A very strong view of European influence in the Indian design and aesthetics, like that of the Gothic architectural styles, pro proving the dominance. In so, you know, if you see Calcutta, you see Madras, you see Bombay, all of them have very strong British design, you know, whether it's architectural or uh, urban design, or even clothing and painting styles, you know, jewelry, all this brought the European influences into India. But Ahmedabad remained dedicated to its own grammar of design. And I'll tell you how wonderful that was. With the induction of Europe. So here is Queen Victoria, and you see the, the textiles and everything, you know, with, with, with Indian influences. You know, this is actually, uh, you know, this is celebration of King George V, it's not Queen Victoria, George V and Queen Mary becoming the Empress of India at the Delhi Darbar of 1911, which became the grandest event of the 20th century. You know, it's the, all the Maharajas and people went to Delhi with the most spectacular. So it was from here that Cartier started designing jewels for the Maharajas and Louis Vuitton made, came here to make the suitcases for the Maharajas and Hermes made their saddles. The three of world of the world's three great luxury companies of Europe started great inroads into India with our Maharajas and making things and designing things from for them. And here you see you know, the Victoria Terminus, which is also world heritage structure. This was built, you know, named after Queen Victoria, and it has architect, the Gothic and Indian style blended together to create a new, new grammar of design called the indo sarcenic design. And it is one of the most beautiful expressions which combines Europe and India in, in, in an amalgamation of aesthetics. The Victoria Memorial in Calcutta, you know, exquisite in its grandeur and simplicity, blending Indo-European style. Where you see the domes are Indian, the arches, and yet it has the, the Renaissance influences. And you have the Baroda Palace, again built in indo sassanic style. This is the, you know, Baroda is very close to Ahmedabad. And this, in fact, is the largest private residence in the world, you know, in round the corner from Ahmedabad. Around the same time, see, now, when European influences are coming into India, and India is building Gothic and indo sassanic style, what did Ahmedabad do? I mean, the Victoria Terminus and the uh, Gateway of India and were, were designed by you know, British architects, but the workers came from Ahmedabad. And in 1835, my family created the company, design company, which built all these. But that was not enough because that was still European design. So it is very interesting that in, in uh, with Rudyard, you know, you all have probably read the book Jungle Book, you know, with Mowgli and you know, see the cartoon and everything. Well, Rudyard Kipling wrote the Jungle Book, and his father, you know, Lockwood Kipling, was a great artist and architect and designer who lived in Lahore and in, at that time in, in India, in Delhi, Lahore, Mumbai, travel here, and he was commissioned to build the new Darbar for Queen Victoria's home so that the Maharajas visiting England could be entertained by Queen Victoria in this grand room. And we took the Teasing Design Company, Lockwood 
Kipling designed Queen Victoria's that bar hall on the Isle of Wight on Osborne House. And this is done, you know, with the peacock, dancing peacocks, the blossoming lotuses on the ceiling, the jarukas. So think of it, Ahmedabad designed the most powerful palace in the world when the rest of the world was imitating her. Design, my friends, a fashion or style comes top down, not bottom up. This is the Darbar Hall for a banquet for the Maharajas. And interestingly, continuing that legacy after 100 years, I was invited again by the British Crown to do a show at Buckingham Palace for the Queen's Coronation Festival. So that legacy in Ahmedabad of design continues. Well, after Queen, once Queen Victoria died and you know, the world went to turmoil and we had World War I and World War II. Now, during these times, the entire world was in great trauma. And the, after World War II, the, during World War II, the United States joins the war and with his nuclear arsenal brings the war to a halt. With that, the power shifted from Europe to America. And America became the most powerful country in the world. And so American influences started entering all aspects of design. You know, Jackson Pollock, Andy Warhol, all these are great American artists. And you know, Tiffany, Lockwood de Forest, great architecture I think, started emerging from the United States. And that became important. So what does Ahmedabad do? With the shift of power, we experience the influence of the Western sides, the Indian culture introducing Dr. De Forest to India, immensely influenced on the Indian culture. So here, the Dr. De Forest was an American uh, billionaire, and he was a brother-in-law of, of Louis Tiffany and was married into the uh, family that in, invented the dynamite and, and the very powerful European and American families. He, on his honeymoon, came to India and he wanted to create something exotic. You know, America was looking at a, a new story. And, and in 1881, Lockwood de Forest and the Hathi Singhs created the Ahmedabad Design Company and the Ahmedabad Wood Carving Studio. Now, can you look at this building? It's a landmark building, a beautiful Ahmedabad carved haveli, which is a heritage home, a very important one in Manhattan. This is not in Ahmedabad. It's Ahmedabad Haveli designed for Lockwood de Forest in New York, right in Manhattan on 14 West 11th Street. And it is now the Jewish center for NYU. New York University owns it and preserves it as a great example of design. It was the first collaboration between United States and India in design. So much so that it became so popular that they designed the interiors of Yale University Deanery, Tiffany Home, as well as the Andrew Carnegie House, which became, which is today the Cooper Hewitt Museum, Design Museum of Smithsonian. So American, the Smithsonian, which is the largest museum based in America, has its design orientation interiors done by Ahmedabad. And among the design at Lockwood Forest, like the City Sayyid Mosque was the finest in uh, carved work he could see and anywhere. And this is still a very prominent design of Ahmedabad. And in fact, in an article written in 1910 for the magazine Handcraft, the forest remained in praise of ancient Indian tradition of wood carving techniques and preserved over the years. It's a very important document of asking America to support, because this is time of industrialization and everything was being mass produced. The first industry, he was the first advocate to say, let us embrace industrialization, but let us also support hand craftsmanship. If we don't do that, then a very important aspect of humanity's heritage would be extinct. His words echo very powerfully, even a hundred years later, and all of us when we involved in design must also look at preserving hand craftsmanship. With that, it was, he found great patrons, Louis Tiffany, Lockwood de Forest, and the Hatti Singhs from Ahmedabad 
created, were commissioned to do the East Wing of the White House. So after doing Queen Victoria's Palace in uh, Isle of Wight in, um, in UK, Ahmedabad went on to do the interiors of the new most powerful person in the world, the American president. And the White House interiors of East Wing were done by, from Ahmedabad in Ahmedabad, in Ahmedabad style. So this is the Lockwood Forest, Ahmedabad style, the interiors. In fact, in, you know, when the Grand Palais was built in Paris in 1900, you know, this is the Grand Palais or called Grand Palace. It was done to host the World Expo of 1900. Now, people from India are still under British rule. So, you know, during that time, the Hutti Singh Company with Lockwood Forest and Tiffany won nine gold medals as the finest design firm in the world. That was from Ahmedabad. And in 2010, I was invited to partner with Yves Saint Laurent and Cartier to do an exhibition in Paris. The president of France inaugurated and was, there was a patron. And we showcased 266 pieces of fine couture from the, no, the Delhi Darbar collection of our private collection in Paris. And 400 pieces of Yves Saint Laurent went to the Grand Palais and uh, together we juxtapose 100 years of fine couture, never before done in the world. But that again of fashion happened from Ahmedabad. This is a girl palais. With coming of time in the end of World War I and World War II, India was getting restless and Mahatma Gandhi has started the Swaraj movement. No, Indian crafts have been recognized at, at an outstanding role for freedom study. So from crafts, we went on to weaving, to creating the charkha and creating khadi. The khadi became the warp and weft of India's independence and things changed from grandeur to simplicity. And here you have people walking in khadi and, and you know, the Gandhi ashram on the Sriva Sabarmati was in Ahmedabad. So Ahmedabad became the center point for Mahatma Gandhi and the, in India's freedom movement, Swaraj. And it was in 1970 that he came here. And for the next several year, decades, you know, the eye of the storm of Swaraj and India's independence was Ahmedabad. It was from here that Gandhiji and our national leaders designed India's independence. It was a strategy of design and of incorporating that the salt march started from here where Gandhiji said, I'll pick up a handful of salt and not come back till India is independent. And this is Mahatma Gandhi at the Gandhi Ashram in Ahmedabad. It's a very beautiful building. All of you must visit it and understand and feel the absolute serenity of this man's ideology and thought. It is a very spiritual experience which will help you in designing things which are efficient and simple. Yeah. So here you have Gandhiji marching to pick up to the Dandi march to pick up a handful of salt. It started from Ahmedabad. 1930. Leading yeah. after independence, we are coming to modern India. You know, India is independent. You know, the salt march lit, you know, brought us what Winston Churchill had said at that time. What can a half-naked fucky do to the might of the British Empire? And well, we know what history has proven. India was an independent nation and Winston Churchill was out of a job. He lost the election. And the man. With modern India, you know, do we just sit back and see our historic monuments? No, we had to keep pace with the world. And so Ahmedabad patrons and Mahajans invited Le Corbusier, one of the greatest architects of that time, you know, he was Swiss French architect, to design and create four important buildings in Ahmedabad. In return, they funded and helped Corbusier design Chandigarh. And so Corbusier designed the city of Chandigarh as an urban planner and four private buildings in Ahmedabad, which are still considered exceptional around the world and world over people come to see it. 
One is the Atma building, the Ahmedabad Textile Mill Owners Association. It's considered one of the finest buildings ever built by Corbusier. It's beautiful and way ahead of its time. And you know, its design is eternal. This is the Atma building then by Corbusier. This is the Sanskar Kinder, the Ahmedabad you know, uh, City Hall. Again, designed by Corbusier, which is interior is just magnificent. You know, I hope the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation will spruce it up again to the time that it used to be. The Sa Villa Sarabhai. And you know, it is fantastic. See, design has to also incorporate and work with, your, with the client. It, design is not independent of utility or, you know, uh, client interaction. So when my uncle and my godfather Anand Sarabhai was a young boy and his mother, my grandfather, commissioned the Villa Sarabhai, Kurbuze asked him that, what would you like in your house? And the young boy says, my uncle, I would love to go from a bedroom straight to the swimming pool. And so you see a concrete side from the first floor from his bedroom straight into the swimming pool. This is an in ingenious design that made Corbusier the world's great architect. So this is a very important building designed by Corbusier in Ahmedabad. Then comes Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn was also a very important city. Europe and we also need America, American art based architect in Philadelphia. And we, he, he, Louis Kahn designed the capital of Bangladesh and many very important urban cities and towns across the world. And so the Mahajans of Ahmedabad invited him to come and design a very important building, which is the IIM Ahmedabad, Indian Institute. It was the first IIM in India and it's still ranked as number one and a very important business school around the world. And so IIM, this is Louis Kahn Plaza and Louis Kahn designed the Indian Institute of Management, taking Ahmedabad again into the modern world. Then comes National Institute of Design, NID. Again, the Mahajans created this institute and it was Charles and Ray Ames, great American designers were invited, you know, in the, to create NID and they created the most fantastic molded furniture that, that the first time to use wood to create molded furniture, photography, architecture, industrial design, and many other arts were contributed to Charles and Ray Ames. And even today around the world, they're considered with a very important uh, minds and mentors to create modern design in various fields. The World Expo, of, which happened in Moscow, the India Pavilion was the Nehru Commission, Charles and Ray Ames designed the India Pavilion in the World Expo of Moscow. They built, helped with, with the margins to create National Institute of Design, NID in Amdaman. This is NID in 1961. Henceforth, Ahmedabad became the center of education, art, and design, handing over a legacy to the next generation. You see, all these things right from Alburim, India, to the Mughal emperors, and Queen Victoria, to the, and her home, to the White House of the East Wing, American interior decorators, jewelers, artists, all came to Ahmedabad and contributed. This is a legacy that is going to, to going continuing till today like the Petty Umo in Florence and the Venice Biennale in Venice. And that continues its tradition of design innovation, design patronage, and design involvement. Most, one of the most important of these is the Raw Collaborative, you know, which, is, which happens every year at the Corbusier home of Ahmedabad, in a, in a building of Ahmedabad Textile Milano, uh, where Conozo art, decor, design, aesthetics to witness the works of India's finest designers come interact, browse, and assemble with them. And there are workshops, seminars, uh, interaction, and pro product interaction that people across India come here to you know. It's a great, uh, it's a very proud thing to interact with, and I hope you will take advantage of this. And this is an exhibition of furniture and art at Rock Collaborative in 2019. 2019 is beautiful. And you see the movement from classical to the contemporary. This is a, the, in the building designed by Courbusier, uh, and this was the conference hall, and you see 
display of contemporary furniture, the legacy continues from ancient times to modern day. This is again the stall displaying Indian contemporary Indian design in Ahmedabad. Beautiful. That is a journey of the design evolves with changing times, and we are committed to exploring the impact of design and change. Its research to bring about a positive change, collaboration, and consciousness. Now, this is a very important statement which modern designers need to embrace. Because many people think that whatever they think and imagine and they create or design, must people must buy. That's not so. It has to be conscious. It has to be communicative, interactive, and user friendly. Conscious living by design. That is the motto of Rock Collaborative. Then taking it beyond the Rock Collaborative is Ahmedabad Design Week. Now, conference, workshops, exhibitions, installations, entertainment, all that happens at Ahmedabad Design Week. And students and people and professionals from across the world come here and interact. Now, is an ode to Ahmedabad electricity in many ways at the cradle of design education in India. Come, let's design in India. Even the Prime Minister of India, after saying make in India, his new motto is design in India. The making is, a, is like a Xerox machine that, that copies anything. Designing is where value addition comes in and we can raise our economy and raise our standards by designing better products and a better world. So Ahmedabad Design Week and World Design Organization and, and in other important joint hands together to create Ahmedabad Design Week. For the, and you know, these are glimpses of that, you know, it's beautifully done. Just like the Venice Biennale, we have our own interpretation attracting the world here. And it was none other than the Ministry of Industries, Piyush Goyal, who came to inaugurate, which shows that design is a very important aspect of India's economic growth engine. Students, no. Talks, very important and interesting people from around the world talking at Ahmedabad Design Week. Fabulous. From automobiles to contemporary work. The Chris came here, we created a hashtag. So not just designing physical product here, also designing interactive systems and technology. So all this has to be important. We had a fashion show where I was very happy to join and contribute and uh, taking the design into the world of fashion and design. With it. Now, India is a very young country, you know, 50% of the population is, is no more just, you know, the, India was known as a developing country, which was poor, and we had 1.2 billion people were considered mouths to feed. But with 50% of India's population now below 25, it is no longer mouths to feed. I'm hopeful they're brains that think and design. No, and, it, it, in, and only when these brains start thinking and creating, India will become a global power to reckon with. The next generation is you, the students, who have inherited this legacy, a thousand year legacy, you know, from the creation of early Ahmedabad to today. And it is not so simple. You're coming to a city which has the is the most powerful and important city in India and one of the most important in the world with a design legacy. Think design, feel design, and then create design. You know, it is not a casual or careless product. It comes with a lot of thought and a lot of feeling. It is an honor, a privilege, and a responsibility for me to implant this, 
not as an idea, but as an inception into your young and fertile minds. Please design to change the world for a better tomorrow. And you, the young people who are entering this, inheriting this legacy, entering this institute with a great promise for our nation, must lead it with a conscious mind and a gracious heart. Because the speed of thought will always be faster, brighter, and more powerful than the speed of flight or the speed of sound. Your idea, every reality in the world was once an idea, a thought. If you cannot think it, you cannot create it. So think it. But, and your mind will, that inception, that, that seed of thought will create very important design that will help change the world. You can blink and blind the sun in a split second, more than its rays, faster than the rays of sun can reach you. That is the power and speed of thought. I would like to thank two very young and dynamic students of UID, Aditi Jivedi and Sarani Patel, who helped me create the visuals for this foundation, this presentation. I always involve students who I'm going to address because their vision and their, when they work on a project, they learn from a project. And I hope that once you all join the Institute, I will have the privilege and honor to interacting with all of you. And together, we'll help design a better tomorrow and a better world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir. This was really inspiring and exhilarating. To see a little the over time, but I'm sorry. Yes. So sometimes you just don't see the time. Yeah. Uh, it was a very inspiring and exhilarating indeed to see the legacy and contribution of Ahmedabad to design the world over and our beloved city's influence in almost every sphere of human life. Irrespective of the duration we are here, we are indeed proud to now call ourselves Ahmedabadis. I don't think our students could have had anybody better or more knowledgeable than you to introduce us to the city again. Thank you so very much for your time and for your kindness. It was really a pleasure. a pleasure and privilege. We look forward to having you on campus soon as all the students are over. Thank you so very much. Thank you.